Today we're looking at Luke chapter 5. It's the third book in the New Testament. Luke chapter 5. Right at the beginning there. And uh, we're also learning our memory verse, so let's say it together. It goes right along with the song. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. And take it away. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew six thirty three. Okay, and let's read... Luke 5, 1-11, through 11. it says here, One day Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and that is uh, the Sea of Galilee, uh, with people crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But said, Because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled up their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. That's our reading. There's a couple of verses that I want you to pay attention to. But uh, first of all, what I want you to notice here, and this is in case you're a Bible nerd like like me, um, in seminary they teach you to look at passages like this. This is a typical typical, uh, Mideastern story style. The boat goes out. Jesus speaks to Peter, saying, catch fish. Peter speaks to Jesus, kind of with a little bit of arrogance, and then in the middle is like the high point. That's the, the climax of the story. That's the dramatic part. And then it kind of winds down. Peter speaks to Jesus in repentance. Jesus speaks to Peter to catch people. And then the boat returns. So there's this, this pattern here. And most stories in the Bible, or say many stories in the Bible, follow this, this pattern of kind of like a hill there. And so it's just, it's a way that stories are told and points are are made by the stories. Anyways, in case you're a Bible nerd and you uh, are into that kind of stuff. But let's just take a look at this passage here. From what we know, from what it says here, Peter has been up all night fishing and he's probably ready for bed. You fished at night back then, and even still today from what I read. And so when you work third shift, usually you're kind of tired when you get back from your shift, and you want to go home and go to bed. For any of you who have worked third shift, you probably know what I'm talking about. Who works third shift here? One, two, three... Four, maybe? Okay. All right. You're kind of exhausted at the end of the day. 
And so Peter is washing his nets, getting ready to go home, and then suddenly Jesus steps into his boat, of all the other boats on the shore, and says, hey, can you uh, paddle me out so I can uh, preach from the water? And so Peter is kind of it's like, oh man. Jesus asks Peter for a boat ride, and Peter owes Jesus so he can't say no, because just a little bit beforehand, just in the the last chapter at the very end, Jesus just healed Peter's mother-in-law who was in bed with a fever. And so back back then, you know, exchange of favors was kind of an expected thing. You know, if somebody had done something really good for you, then it was kind of just expected that you would do something in return. And so Peter, under social obligation, he can't really say no because... Jesus just did him a big favor. So, Peter grins and again bears it, probably. And to keep from drifting away, if he's, Jesus is on a boat and he's preaching from that boat, you have to be actively rowing the whole time. So, otherwise the boat would drift away. So, Peter would have had to be constantly rowing while Jesus was preaching from the boat. So he's just been working for all night, and now he's got to work some more. And I'm guessing Jesus wasn't a, a quick soundbite sort of a preacher. He probably had a lot of things to say. And so who knows how long Peter had to do all of that extra rowing for Jesus to be preaching to everyone. But then it gets... Then it gets even more, more uh, interesting for Peter here. In verse 4, When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon Peter, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Okay? Now, to, to us, we're thinking, okay, well, he's Jesus, he knows everything, and Peter, he's just a disciple, he doesn't know a whole lot, but... At this point, Peter hadn't, didn't know Jesus very well yet. He knew that he had healed his mother-in-law. And so, in the next verse, he'll call him Master, because he respects him. But he didn't realize who Jesus really was yet. All he probably thought is that Jesus is a carpenter and he's telling a professional fisherman how to fish. Imagine someone coming into where you work who's never been there before and starts telling you how to do your job. You're not doing your job very well. You need to do it totally opposite. And not only do you need to do it totally opposite, but... Jesus' fishing tactics are all wrong. They're all the rookie mistakes. It's pretty obvious that Jesus is not a fisherman, that he hasn't been on the water much. And so, Simon Peter is thinking to himself, okay, you don't fish in deep water. You fish along the shore. That's where the fish are. Because there's streams that feed the lake, and that's where the most oxygenated water is, and so that's where the fish like to congregate. And so you don't fish in deep water, you fish near the shore, and not only that, you don't fish in the daytime. The fish see the nets coming and they swim away. And it's daytime. You fish at night so they don't see it coming, and then you can catch more. Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. He's some guy who's a carpenter, and he's from the, the hills out in Galilee, and he comes down to the lake, and suddenly he knows everything about fishing. So in verse 5, I want you to pay attention to how Peter speaks to Jesus here. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. 
but because you say so, I will let down the nets. So Peter calls Jesus Master, not Lord. He calls him Lord later. He calls him Master. He respects Jesus, but not fully. He doesn't fully trust him. He doesn't realize who Jesus is just yet. He thinks Jesus is probably some cool guy, a prophet, somebody who can heal. So, you know, a pretty good guy, but he's definitely not a fisherman. He's making all the rookie mistakes. And in the Greek, Peter's response emphasizes all night. We've been out all night and we've caught nothing. Those are the parts of the sentence that get emphasized. All night and nothing. And then his agreement is probably snarky. We can't really catch too many nuances here, but based on the circumstances, it's a safe bet to say that Peter was probably thinking, oh, oh, so you think you know how to fish? Okay. Well, if you say so, remember, we're doing this because you thought that we should do this. Let's go out into deep water in the daytime, and we'll see how many fish we catch. And then I'll get to look at you afterwards and say, see? Well, of course, in verses 6 and 7, they caught so many fish that the boat couldn't sustain them. They couldn't lift the nets into the boat And even with two boats there, the boats began to sink because there were so many fish. So this is a dramatic catch of fish. This is like Peter just hit the jackpot. This is a a once-in-a-lifetime sort of a catch. Peter just struck gold here. He and all of his partners are going to be filthy rich. So now in verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. So Peter calls Jesus Lord now. And Lord, the way that he uses it, is the word that's used for God all throughout the Old Testament. So, for Peter, Jesus went from being a guy to respect to the Lord. He is the Lord. Peter knows this is a miracle because nobody catches fish in deep water in the daytime, especially at this quantity. This is a miracle catch. This is not just some random lucky thing. And Peter was now rich. He was filthy rich. And all he can do, all he can think about is admit that he's sinful and unworthy. Isn't that interesting? Instead of jumping up and down and saying, I'm rich, he falls at his feet or at Jesus' knees and says, Lord, I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to be in your presence. It's not, it's not the response we might have expected from him. Well, like we can, there's, there's a lot of other things going on in this story. We could talk about those too, but we'll just stop there for now. Like Peter, we also get caught up in the smaller things. We sweat the small stuff. So we will have days of total failure and maybe no money and we still have a bunch of work to do. There'll there'll be those days when everything's going wrong. Maybe we're totally out of cash. Maybe we're in debt and there's still work to do. And we're just drained and exhausted. 
We'll be, there will be days like that. And on top of that, we might be having one of those days and suddenly we'll be in this situation where we know God wants us to do something, like to love our neighbors in some way. And we might see God's commands from a human point of view, like this is ludicrous. You, I mean, really? Right when, I'm, right when I'm down and at my low point, you expect me to go the extra mile even now? So, for example, answering kindly to somebody who's just downright mean, that's hard. Especially when you're already stressed out to the max. It's hard to answer somebody kindly or gently or even to just walk away when your stress level is already this high. That's hard. Or rushing in to help when everyone else is running away. That's hard. It, uh, when the plague was going through Europe, everybody was terrified of the plague because nobody knew where it came from or how you got the plague at all. And they would just wall up sections of the city with a bunch of people in it just to, just to keep the plague in there. And they would just let all those people die because it was just spreading so fast. But there are stories of everybody else running out of a city and Christians running in to help. Christians were risking their lives to help people with the plague while everybody else was running away. That's hard to do. Or there's some people where we'll have an opportunity, like somebody will give us an opportunity. Boy, life can just be so exhausting. Or do you ever wonder if there's a God up there? And we'll just get a pitch lobbed right at us. And we'll have a perfect opportunity to talk about Jesus Christ. But some people, it's kind of hard to talk about Jesus Christ with them. You know, they, they're not the type. They're, they're, the, they're the kind of person maybe who just swears all the time and is just covered in tattoos and piercings and they just don't look like they would accept Christ at all. But they need Christ too, just as much as we do. And you'd be surprised. Or you might think that there's a person in your life and this person is just hopeless. What? I'm just sick of helping this person. There's no use. Or then Peter, when he realized that Jesus was who he was, and then realized, I am a sinner. And he falls at his knees and he said, I don't deserve to be here with you. There's times we might be too discouraged from our sin. There's times when we just might feel just guilty or just shameful or embarrassed. And we just might feel totally unworthy. And that's a, that's, that's a great place for Satan to catch us because then we won't do anything. We'll just kind of sit here and be bashful and ashamed. And that's not, that's not the way God wants us to operate. He doesn't want to just sit and sulk and beat ourselves up. We're not commanded to just go around and smack ourselves in the face when we do something wrong. Any experience of God will involve some sense of unworthiness. But the idea is to move forward in trusting God. So if you're praying, if you're having a moment where you just kind of have this awareness, wow, God... 
God just really showed up here. If you, just ha- if you ever have any of those moments, there's going to be some part of you that's going to be like, wow, I'm, I'm unworthy here. God's way up there and I'm way down here. And it will humble you. You'll feel humble. That's normal. But it ought not to be so devastating that it flattens you and leads you to do nothing. That's that's too much. That's overkill. We need to move forward trusting God because Jesus doesn't say, yeah, stay down there by my feet because, yeah, you're right. You don't deserve to be next to me. You are a horrible sinner. Jesus doesn't say that. He says, don't be afraid. From now on, I I have something bigger for you to do. When Peter did things his way, nothing happened. Peter was a professional fisherman, and he caught fish for a living. That's how he paid his bills, and that's how he ate. Supported his family and everything. He knew what he was doing. He just had a bad, bad night. But in this story, when Peter was doing things his way, nothing happened. He was doing, using everything that he knew how to do. Sometimes when you and I are doing things that we know how to do, and we think that we're doing things exactly the way that we're supposed to, sometimes nothing comes out of that. And that's because we're putting too much stock in what we know. Okay, I know how to do this. I, I know what I'm doing here, and, and, and this is the way it has to be, and, and I'm just going to do it that way. But when we get a little too overconfident, sometimes nothing happens. And Peter was rich from this huge catch of money. He could have jumped up and down and said, money, money, money. Think of all the stuff I can do now. And instead of doing that, he realizes that Jesus can provide for all of his needs. This, this huge fortune of money that he just got, instead of saying, wow, look at all the money I just got, he realizes, whoa, this guy, this, the, he, he can provide for everything I need. All I need is Him. That's that's the way we're supposed to respond. When we've been very blessed by God, we're supposed to realize, hey, I I have a God who gives me all these good things. I don't have to worry about these things. When we live life trusting in God's directions for us, then all these things shall be added unto you. So Jesus gave Peter a whole new job. You're not going to be a fisherman anymore. You're going to be a fisher of men. And it says he, he, he just up and left his job. No two weeks notice. I'm sure the fish went to somebody else. And if he just left his boats right there, I'm sure somebody else would have claimed them. Hey, perfectly good boat just sitting here. I'll take that. But suddenly none of that mattered anymore because Jesus can provide for all of his needs. And if Jesus gave gave him something else to do, why not? Let's see what else is going to happen. When we do what Jesus says, our things like income, food, our house, money, it doesn't matter anymore. That's hard to understand. It's hard to apply. That's what the Bible teaches. Look at the screen here with me. What does the third request of the Lord's Prayer mean? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven means 
Help us and all people to reject our own wills and to obey your will without any backtalk. Your will alone is good. Help us one and all to carry out the work we are called to as willingly and faithfully as the angels in heaven. And let's pray. Our God in heaven, we worry about our needs, our routines, our, our disappointing days. And yet, Lord, if we put our trust in you, somehow you can relieve us from all of those worries and anxieties. That's hard for us to understand. It's hard for us to apply. But Lord, we pray that we would realize what you are talking about. And that, Lord, we would, we would be like Peter in his response. That we would realize that you are not just a master, but you are our Lord. That, Lord, you provide for all of our needs. And that we need not worry, even on the worst and most discouraging of days. Help us to realize that and to apply that. And may it mean something to us. And may we be able to encourage others who are going through the same things. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.